Lord, ask to bless our time. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your presence, God, for your spirit. And God, we pray that you would do the thing that only you can do, and that is to cause this word to come alive and just change us, God, completely, thoroughly, and powerfully. We love you, God, and we thank you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we're looking at a brand new series of, stu of, of studies through the book of Colossians that I've entitled, Jesus at the Center of It All. Now, before we move on, let me just say at the front end of this thing that the greatest, single, most important decision that a person can ever make is to put Jesus Christ at the center of it all. Now, by at the center of it all, I mean every last bit of it. Not just a day of the week, not just a portion of our lives, but we are to make Jesus central as it relates to the entirety of our lives. Now, the reason why I say this is because many times as Christians, we like to set up our lives like TV dinners. How many of you guys remember the TV dinners? Uh, and uh, when I was a kid, you used to stick them in the oven because there was no microwave, and they used to be like this tin, like, uh, you know, it's just, it just terrible. You know, as you had the mystery meat with who knows what was in that gravy, you know, some kind of dessert and some stuffing and, and all this kind of stuff, but everything was in compartments, nothing touched each other. And yet, that's how we like to set up our lives. We have the career compartment, we have the relationship compartment, we have the hobby compartment, we have the children compartment, we have the poker night with the buddies compartment, and then we have the Jesus on Sunday only compartment. And we separate our lives, you know, into these compartments. But it doesn't work that way. As it relates with Jesus, He is the compartment, and everything that we do must be tempered through that reality. For you see, Jesus just isn't a day in the calendar. Jesus wants to be the calendar, as in He wants to be part of our every day and every moment. And that's what we're going to look at as we consider this short but powerful book. It's four chapters long, 95 verses in length, but man, oh man, do we see Jesus shining through this book. In fact, Jesus is the centerpiece. To which some of you would say, well, Pedro, I thought he was the centerpiece of the whole Bible. Yes, he is. But because of the issue that Paul is writing to, he is writing to the church in, in Colossae, and he's correcting some doctrinal error that was arising because of some Gnostic teachers that had some bad and false ideas as to who Jesus was. So Paul never had been to Colossae. He's writing to the church at Colossae, correcting this error on this false teaching on Jesus. So in the process of it, what we have is a four-chapter book that is perhaps the most Christological in all of the Bible. You see, the focus of this study is about Jesus. He is the theme of the book of Colossians. And any time that we gaze upon Jesus and study the person of Jesus and consider Jesus and meditate upon Jesus, listen, our lives are going to be radically transformed by Jesus because a person that sees Jesus will never be the same. And that is my prayer that as we go through this book, we would see Jesus in a fresh and powerful way like we've never seen him before, that we would get a revelation that would cause transformation. Now, here today, just the first two verses of the epistle. Now, I suppose that as it relates to putting Jesus at the center, um, it must first start with an intentional decision that we're going to do that in our lives. We need to start by saying, you know what? I'm going to do whatever it takes to put Jesus at the center of my life. Now, if this part of our life is off, everything is going to be off. So we need to make sure that who we are is wrapped up in who he is. Let me repeat that. We need to make sure that who we are is wrapped up in who he is. And, and in order for that to happen, we need to have a proper understanding as to who we really are. We need to have a proper understanding of our identity. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about. We're going to look at the issue of true identity. And the reason, well, I believe that if you and I are going to go through life and effectively live out the plan of God for our lives, we need to first understand our identity, who it is that we are, because it is a question whose answer will give us direction, purpose, and meaning. We need to come to grips 
with our identity. Now, some of you might say, well, Pedro, that's easy. I know what my identity is. I know who I am. My name is John Smith. I live on 1060 West Addison Street. And, uh, you know, this is my phone number and my social security number. No, I'm not talking about your address or your social security number or all this kind of stuff. That's what they say. Oh, they take that identity theft. And, you know, and it's like, oh, some guy's got me saying he's me and he's buying all kinds of houses someplace, you know, and he's ruining my credit. You know, that's not the kind of identity that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about your real identity, the spiritual identity, the real you. Because as long as you haven't figured this out, your life is going to be completely aimless and with no point and with no significant rhyme or reason. Now there might be some of you here that you're feeling that way. You feel like your life has no significant rhyme or reason. It doesn't make sense to you. You're going through this life and you're like going, what in the world is this all about? You feel like you're on some kind of a hamster wheel. You know, there you are on the hamster wheel. Hey, 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 boom, boom. And you're drinking out of a little pipe. You know, a little water thing. And it's like, oh, the floor is newspaper. What is this? You know, and uh, it's like, you know, your life is like, man, you're like, wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, get dressed, go to work, eat lunch, continue to work, punch out, come home, eat dinner, watch TV, go to sleep, repeat process, 50 years, then retirement plan, then wait and put on the waiting list for death. And that's it. And it's like, ah! Hey, I can't, but what's going on here? You see, and here we are in this survival mode when the life that God has for you is to be in revival mode. But in order for that to happen, you need to figure out who you are. And that's what we're going to look at in a message that I've entitled Identity. And in this message, I want to answer the question of who we are in God and settle the issue once and for all. So let's go ahead and read the passage. I want to look at three things concerning our identity. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ here we have a typical salutation that Paul would normally give to the churches he is writing to now in this particular one he says that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God because his authority had been challenged by the people there in Colossae because there was these Gnostic teachers that thought they had the corner on the spiritual market so they started you know talking down Paul and talking down his teaching because they thought they had a higher more sophisticated more knowledgeable kind of a understanding as to what life was and who Jesus was so they would always try to detract from the Apostle Paul now we're gonna be looking at this Gnostic teaching and uh, at the different fallacies of it and we're gonna be looking at how many of the world religions today and some of the cults you know within Christ you know that claim to be Christian which are not for example like Christian science which is Neither. Neither is it Christian nor is it science. But, uh, you know, they have all this weird kind of, uh, you know, understanding as to who Jesus is. But that's what Paul's going to address. Now, I want you to know there's nothing new under the sun. You know, everything is just repackaged and rehashed and sold by a different group of people. But all that stuff is as old as what we're reading here in the sense that they always had weird doctrines about Jesus. So here Paul is defending who he is authority by saying, I am Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And then, of course, he mentions Timothy, his uh, faithful protege, a guy that Paul has poured his entire life into and just taken all kinds of risk upon and says, you know, this, this guy has my heart. And there's nothing like having a Timothy that has your heart. And, and Paul here, I mean, just loves Timothy. And we'll end up talking more about Timothy, you know, as we go on throughout the several, next several weeks in our study. But then he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. And that, of course, he's now saying, hey, this is who I'm writing it to. And then grace to you and peace from our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is basically a blessing. So basically, this is just your typical Pauline salutation. Now, from this salutation that we see Paul use here, we also get some theological truth as it relates to who we are and what our identity is and the first truth that I want you to write down is this and this is something that I pray would just cause your mind to just light up and uh, and and for you to embrace this because many of us are trapped in these three things that I'm going to talk to you about the first one is understand that what we do and what we have isn't what defines us what we do and what we have is not what defines us. 
But yet, sad to say, that mindset is more relevant and more prevalent than we care to admit. For you see, we're living in a world that has people that try to derive their identity from all the wrong things and all the wrong places. In essence, we are letting the things that um, we do in the sense of our career or whatever, we'll talk about those in just a moment, we allow those things to define who we are and what our identity is. No wonder we're living in a world that is having such a massive identity crisis because they are trying to derive their identity from things that are ultimately irrelevant in reality. For example, there's some people that try to derive their identity from their career. They think that what they do is what defines them. They are so wrapped up in their work that they can't see their life apart from it in the sense that their work is what defines them. And they see themselves as they get promoted as their value and their worth increasing. But the same thing goes the other way. If you get demoted instead of promoted, now you feel like your value and your worth has gone down. So it's like you are so entrenched in your work that that is what becomes something there that defines you. I mean, your self-worth goes up and down by whether or not or how it is that you are doing your job or perceived of how you're doing your job. People are deriving their identity from what it is that they do. Then there are those that derive their identity by what it is that they wear. It's like their wardrobe. You know, they're always looking, you know, at other people that they might idolize and look up to and they see what they're wearing and now suddenly they want to be them and now they're wearing their, that clothes and it's like, you know, it's like my style and that's who I am. You know, my dress dictates who I am, my wardrobe. And there's people that are like that. You know, they go through the fashion magazines and they look at this thing and it's like, I mean, who determines what fashion is anyways? You know, because sometimes you look into these magazines and it's this lady, you know, and it looks like she's wearing a peacock on her head, you know, with all these feathers and the, it's the ugliest dress in the world. You know, it's a mixture between a peacock and a stork. And there you're like, what is this? And if someone says that's cool and people look at it and say, man, that is the most hideous thing I've ever seen in the world. Where can I buy one? You know, and it's like, what in the world is this? You know, it's like, this is nuts, you know? But yet, that's the kind of world that we live in. Why? Because we have no sense of what our true identity is. And when we have no sense of what our true identity is, we will start chasing after all manner of ridiculousness, trying to figure it out. Some people have their identity wrapped up in their car. You know, their car is just a part of their image. It's who they are. It's boom, blah, 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 blah. You know, kind of a thing. And it's, it's just crazy. You know, it's like such an intricate part of my thing. And I got my gloves on, you know, and everything. And it's like, you know, and all the rest. And we just trick out our cars, you know. And sometimes you look at a car, you know, and I've seen cars that the rims and tires are worth more than the car. You know, it's like, <laughs> this car, those rims are cool, but the car is like, the doors are falling, boom, boom. You know, kind of a deal. You know, and whatever the case, man, all those things are, are I, I love cars, man. You know, you know, I love looking at somebody else's car, you know, that they've paid for and everything else and kind of you know I, I love going to the car shows and all that kind of deal I love it you know but here's the deal if we are seeking to find identity in any of those things we are barking up the wrong tree but yet that is where many people find themselves and what ends up happening is we end up spending our lives buying things we can't afford with money we don't have to impress people we don't know and impress friends that we don't even like. And there we are, chasing after these things, all because there's a failure of understanding who we really are, and we end up living our lives trying to be someone we really are not. Well, Pedro, then, who are we? You know, what is our identity? Well, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, the word there for workmanship is the Greek word poema, where we get our English word for poem. Now, what Paul is implying here is that we are God's work of art. Now, I know you might not think that. Your spouse is saying amen. Uh, <laughs> 
Your spouse, your spouse might say, I think he's his piece of work, but not a workmanship. Listen, you are his piece of workmanship. You know, you are God's work of art. He made you with an original DNA, with a spiritual DNA, with a divine fingerprint on you. He created you unique and distinct. And because that's true, listen, we need to quit trying to be someone we are not. God created us to be us. He didn't create two of somebody else. And you are doing the world an injustice and you are robbing the church of Jesus Christ by robbing the individual that God has made you to be by seeking to be someone that you're not. What you need to do is forget trying to be someone that you're not and be all that God has created you to be and you're going to go further and farther than you ever dreamed you'll be able to go. And that's the reality, man. And so many people try to climb up this ladder to increase our worth or to try to impress people. Listen, your purpose on this world is singular, and that is to bring glory to the one who made you. That's it. That is why we exist. That is who we are. That is what defines us. We were made by him, for him, for the purpose of living for his glory, living out his will for our lives, making then our career or our job merely the platform from which we do that from. And that is what our call is. That is why we're made. It is to live for the glory of God. And that's what Paul was doing. It says there, he was an apostle by the will of God, simply doing what God made him to do. Now, how about you? Are you doing what God has made you to do? Are you doing his will? I'm not talking about a specific job here now. I'm talking about whether or not you are living for his glory. Whether or not you are leveraging the opportunity that you have before you for the kingdom. Are you in a place where you are being faithful with what God has placed in your hand? Or are you just forfeiting it, just trying to go for something else? Are you being obedient to his will in whatever it is that you find yourself in? Because, man, that is who we are. And if we get transferred from one place to another, your identity does not change. Your identity remains the same. And the reason was well, because your identity isn't defined by what you do. It's defined by the one whose will you are living for. So just make sure that you are doing his will. That you're not doing the will of somebody else. That you're not doing, you know, the will of what you want to do or what's best for what you think is best for you. You need to just do the will of God. Just like the Apostle Paul. Look what it says there. I'm an apostle by the will of God. What are you? Are you an accountant by the will of God? A doctor by the will of God? A teacher by the will of God? A contractor by the will of God? An athlete or a musician by the will of God? A lawyer by the will of God? And yes, that is possible. Uh, you know, there are lawyers that love Jesus. Not many, but there are. And um, I love the ones that come to this church especially. But anyways, um, I'm just kidding about that. So, oh, and this one's the one that's on the radio. But anyways, um, I love them. I love them. But anyways, we need to make sure that we are doing what we, God's called us to do. Whether you're a petroleum transfer engineer, a.k.a. gas station pump attendant. Um, Man, you can do that by the will of God. And you see, here's the thing. None of those are worth more than the other. What's important is, is are you living your life for God? Not just a portion of it, but all of it. So don't settle for anything less. Live for His will, live for His glory, and maximize your life by doing His will for your life. And that's who we are. That's who our identity is. The second thing that I want you to write down, number two, where we live is not our ultimate destination. Where we live is not our ultimate destination. Now, this piece of truth here, when understood, will change our lives completely. For you see, many people, again, define their identity by the neighborhood that they live in. They allow their zip code to dictate their worth and their value. And you've probably met people like that. You know, they ask you, so where do you live? And you tell them. And they're like, oh, it's probably their vibe. You know, all the rest. You know, they start looking down upon you and they say, oh, that's an interesting neighborhood there. Isn't that on the other side of the tracks? Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen an armed robbery take place? Uh, or, you know, have you ever seen a drive by shooting there? Because I hear that kind of happens there in that neighborhood. Or have they ever filmed an episode of Cops there in your front yard? Kind of a deal. And you're like, dude, you live five blocks away from me. What's the matter with you? You know, kind of a thing. You know, and there's people like that. You know, there are people, you know, that live in a world that allows their location to dictate their valuation. 
But here's what we need to remember about that world, and that is that world ain't real. It's actually a fairy tale world where people have these dreams, you know, of, you know, that this is what life is. And the reality is we're chasing after all the wrong things. But yet it's what's been forced upon us by a culture that surrounds us. When at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you end up physically. What matters is, is where you end up eternally. And the thing that determines where we end up eternally, well, that's what we see there in verse 2. Look what it says. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Here we see that these people that he's writing to, they've got two addresses. Dual citizenship. They are faithful brethren in Colossae, but they are also in Christ. So they have an earthly address, and they have a heavenly address. The same is true for me and you. We have two addresses. One that means absolutely nothing in terms of our identity, and one that means everything. You see, it is who we are. We are citizens of the city of the king. We are the king's children. That is who we are. That is where we're going. Now the question then becomes, where are we going to make, in light of that, the greatest investment in our lives? Are we going to make it in a world that's fleeting and fading, or are we going to make it in a world that's enduring and eternal? The truth is, this world has nothing for us except an opportunity for us to go out and impact it with the world that has impacted us. And the world that's impacted us, well, the book of Philippians tells us, we're not from this world, and it says that our citizenship is in heaven. And people, as citizens as such, we need to be people whose lives are properly calibrated for that reality. We need to be people that are governed with the real of eternity. In Colossians chapter 3, we'll get to that, you know, in some other time, maybe two years from now by the time we get there. But anyhow, it says, if you were then raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth, for you died and your sin and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, some people might say, you Christians, man, you guys are so heavenly minded, you aren't any earthly good. To which I say, it's quite the opposite. For you see, you'll never be any earthly good until you are first heavenly minded. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest thinkers of a generation past, said this. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next world. It is since that Christians have largely ceased to think of the next world that they have become so ineffective in this world, end quote. And this is something that we need to really consider in our lives, because I often wonder. I think that many times we believe in heaven with our minds, and we're like, yeah, praise the Lord, we're going to heaven, we're going to heaven, we're going to heaven. Yep, yep, and we memorize the scriptures. Oh, do not let your heart be troubled. I, in my Father's house are many mansions, and I have gone to prepare a mansion for you. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we're going to go there, and everything else. But as we look then at how we're handling this life, and how we are making decisions, and how we structure our life, man, you have to wonder, is that person really living as a pilgrim that's just passing through here, because it looks an awful lot like that he's thinking he's going to be here forever. And I think that many times there's a disconnect from what we believe and the way that we live. Let me give you an example. If I were to tell you that in 30 seconds a bomb's going to go off in here, and then I say that, and then I come over here and take a little sip of my throat coat. <sighs> Tick. Talk. Is that a piano? Oh, they're going to go play chopsticks. I kind of learned that when I was a little kid and, and all the rest. And, and you know that I'm, I, I'm not going to say balanced because I'm not. But, um, you know, you know that I have no thoughts of killing myself or anything like that. But you just see me there. Oh, look at that. That's my old guitar. I'm going to go play it. And uh, oh, look at that bass, man. That's awesome. It's a Gibson. You know, Angus Young has one like it. Or it's only a guitar version of it. You know, kind of a deal. And there, you know, you go, you're like, dude, there's no bomb going to go off in this place. Look, he's not, he's not even moving. You know, uh, I don't think he's really serious about that. But if I said, 30 seconds, a bomb is going to go off. And you see me jump off this platform, grab my family, just run out the door, grab the kids at children's ministry. Oh, guys, go, ah! run like the wind blows out, run for us, run. And there you see me. Next thing you know, I'm like stinking getting on the turnpike. And I'm like, oh, running. You probably say to yourself, I'm under the impression there's a bomb in the building. Why? Because 
my actions are matching with what I said. And yet, many times, we say that we believe in a real heaven and in a real hell for all eternity, and it has zero impact on how we make our decisions. Because if we truly understood that this world was not our home, and that we were just passing through, if we would allow that truth to internalize in our spirit and in our hearts and fully embrace the reality of eternity, listen, everything we do will change. The things we value will change. The things that are important will change. The things that we invest in will change. It will impact the things that we sacrifice for. It will impact the things that we are willing to lose comfort for. Willing to risk it all for. It will impact our worldview entirely. Our lives will suddenly begin to reflect an economy that's not from around here. And the reason was because we aren't from around here. We are just travelers on a journey who are merely passing through as we head for a city not made with hands, whose builder and maker is God. Now, in light of that reality, what are we investing our lives in? Does it still matter what neighborhood we live in? Or does now the attention focus on making sure that our neighbors end up in the neighborhood that we're going to end up in when we get to heaven? Because that's the only thing we can take with us. We can't take money with us. We can't take possessions with us. We can't take anything with us except for whatever investment we make into his kingdom and by way of resource and people. You know, that's all that we can do to take to heaven. You know, there's this lady that, you know, her husband was a millionaire, a gazillionaire, and the husband had one request. Baby, when I die, please bury me with my millions. And the, honey, the wife said, honey, for sure, no problem. I will bury you with all of your millions. No worries. And there the day the death came and, uh, you know, everybody was watching, waiting to see what the lady was going to do. Is she going to bury him with the millions? Because everybody knew about it. So they were about to close the casket. She pulls out the checkbook, writes a check for the millions of dollars, sticks the check inside, lowers it, and says, see you later, buddy. Uh, and uh, <laughs> wrote him a check. Uh, try cashing that somewhere. I'll keep the millions because you cannot take it with you. We can't take anything with us. We are just passing through here. So what are we investing our lives in? The here and now that is fading or the then and there that is for all eternity. And man, when we get a perspective of heaven and the reality of it, man, it begins to just change everything that we do from our priority, relationships, decisions, Everything changes when we realize who we are, where we're going, and what it is that we have been put on this planet to accomplish. So keep that the forefront of your mind. Write that somewhere, somewhere on your wall or somewhere where you're going to see it. This world is not our home. And let that reality impact everything that you do. And finally, the third thing that I want to share with you as it relates to identity, write this down. Who you are is not as important as whose you are. Who you are, many times we're so worried about who we are and the who's who kind of a thing. And, you know, for me, I came out in the who's he um, book. But anyhow, um, you know, it's like who we are. It's not important. What's important is whose you are. That right there is the identity definer. Now, as it relates to ownership, you only got two options here. You either belong to God, to God or you belong to the devil. You belong to God or you belong to Satan. Now, talk about identity theft. Listen, that's what the devil wants to do to you. The devil wants to cause you to forget who you are. Kind of like what they tried to do to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As they were taken from the land that they grew up in, from their spiritual heritage, they knew who they were and they got taken from there and taken and dropped in Babylon who was the complete opposite of what everything they knew and their Babylon tried to give them a new name a new language a new identity a new way of thinking and it says this is how we roll in Babylon this is what we want you to do here this is what we want you to be like we're going to conform you into our image here so we can use you to be a great leader and we want to you know be able to draw from the best of what you got but we want you to be like us and forget your spiritual identity. 
But Daniel rose up and said, and a purpose in his heart, that I will not defile myself with a king's delicacies. I know who I am. I am a child of the living God, and I will not bow down because I know what my identity is. And many times, you know, Satan wants to rip us off from it. But God, on the other hand, he wants us to remember who it is that we are. And we belong to him. The Bible says that we are not our own. He's bought us at a price. And we are to live for his glory. That is why we're on this planet. He wants to move in our lives. He wants to bless our lives. He wants to impact our lives. In God's eyes, we are his special people. Did you know that? You're special. He also says that we are his peculiar people. <laughs> and um, we are that too. Because, uh, man, we're all weird. You know, we all have our weirdness and our craziness. But yet, he still has set us apart. And I want to turn your attention to verse 2 where it says, To the saints and faithful brethren. We're going to look at faithfulness in a future study. But the saints. Do you know that you are all saints here today that have trusted in Jesus Christ? If you put your faith in Jesus, you are a saint. St. Ralph, St. Jamie, St. Tito, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you could be St. Pepe, San Pepe, uh, and uh, you're a saint. No, Pedro, man, you got it. Oh, no, 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 I ain't no saint. I know, listen, you might not be acting like a saint, but because you are in Christ, you are a saint. You know, and, and many of you, perhaps, you might have the same misconception of what a saint is. You know, I, I grew up thinking that a saint was a person that was so good, you know, that when he died, you know, uh, you know, they, miracles happen as you pray to him, and somehow you go through a process where they would canonize him and make him a saint, and once you were official, they'd make these little trading cards of you, little action figures for your dashboard and stuff, and uh, I always wondered why they don't face the action figure that way so he can see and help you drive you know because it's always got the back to the street but anyways uh, those are things that I think of I, I'm sorry I'm just sorry I just I'm just crazy like that if you got a set praise Jesus but anyways um, you know and we think that that's what a saint is but that is not what a saint is you don't end up as a saint you start out as a saint the moment you say yes to Jesus you see the word saint is a Greek word hagios which simply means set apart for Jesus so the moment that we give our lives to him we are set apart we are sanctified we are consecrated for his purposes so if you are a Christian here today let me tell you your identity man you are set apart for the king you are set apart for his purposes. You are a saint. Now, don't go printing up business cards just yet that says Saint Paco, because people are gonna think you're weird. But listen, hide that in your heart because that is who you are. You are one who is set apart for the purposes of God. You, man, you are a person that God has his hand upon you. You are now separated and called to be part of this, not an institution, you are now part of this global family that we call church, that we call home. It's a family affair. We see that in the term where Paul is referring to these guys as brothers. He had never even been there, but yet he's saying, you are my brother. He's referring to Timothy as our brother. And then he refers to God, our father. And we are called into this incredible family where God is the father of us all. The person sitting next to you is your brother and your sister. It's a family deal. And that's who we are. That's what defines us. We are a family connected one to another with God as our dad. Now, I pray that this thought, as we get ready to close here, would be an encouragement to those of you that perhaps feel crippled for whatever reason because of your family lineage. Now, let me just say, as I think of my father here on earth, I can't ask for a better father. I mean, I love my dad. He is amazing. He's a legend. He's the funniest man I know. I would prefer to hang out with him than most anybody except my wife. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I love him and, and he has been a great dad to me. You know, never have I gone to sleep doubting for one second whether or not my dad loves me. But here's what I know to be true. I, I know that not everybody has that. In fact, most people do not have that experience. 
and maybe you come from a family lineage where you feel that because you're part of that family, it has crippled you from moving forward. You feel that you have just dealt with setback after setback after setback just because of your relational tie with your family. You know, they perhaps maybe have done something so bad and something so shameful that it has forever tarnished anything you ever do because of something you never did. The only thing you were ever guilty of was being born. And that's not even your fault. You have no control over that. And there you are. Because of your family, you're carrying a baggage that nobody should be carrying. And it had nothing to do with you. But yet there you are, under the load of it. And you can't even move. Let me just tell you something right now. That is not your identity. You have a God who is your father. He is your king. He is your protector. He is your lineage. He, that, that, is, that is who is our father. That is who we are connected to. Ultimately, you have a father in heaven that believes in you. He loves you. He's got a plan for you. So don't you for a second let whatever your situation was, whatever hand you were dealt with, don't you for a second let that cripple you from the knowing and understanding the reality that you have a Father in heaven who loves you and He wants to take you further and farther than ever you ever dreamed of going. And He's a Father who loves us and you're part of this family. So man, don't you for a second, one, one more second, live under the, you know, banner of, well, my dad is a bum, my grandfather was a bum, my great-great-grandfather was a bum, hence, I'm next in line. In a long list of a line of bummerdom that I belong to. Listen, that is not who you are. You are a child of the true and the living God. You were made in His image. Don't you let that devil rip you off from your spiritual identity. I mean, that is identity theft at its highest. It started in the Garden of Eden where the greatest thievery that has ever taken place took place. Where two created beings that were pulsating with the very glory of God believed the lie of the enemy. Don't you believe the lie of the enemy anymore. You are a child of God and the things that God has for you. He's got plans. His thoughts of you are of peace and of a future to give you a future and a hope of, of love and peace is what God has for you. And man, may we understand that. He loves us. And man, may we never get our eyes off of that. Because that is who we are. That is why we're here. That is our purpose. is to live for the glory of the name. And in the process, carry the glorious name into all the ends of the earth. Wherever it is that he might take us. That we would be faithful with what he has put in our hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness, your grace, and your love, your mercy. And God, I pray for every single one of us that's here. God, I pray that you would cause us to quit running this race that the world has us on. And God, that we would get busy running the race that you have for us that we would set out on the course that you have marked for each individual in this room. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, there might be some of you that you're saying, Pedro, man, I don't have a relationship with God. You're talking about this identity. You're talking about this importance of knowing who you are. But Pedro, man, I have no idea who I am, but I want to know who I am. Pedro, I don't even know where to begin as it relates to relationship with God. Where do I start? What must I do? I feel like I'm a million miles away from God. Well, maybe you are. But here today, all you need to do is take one step towards Him. And there He is, going to be waiting for you. But you got to take that step. Well, Pedro, what must I do? I want to give my life to Jesus. I, I want to surrender my life to Him. But I don't even know where to begin. Well, in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. How so? Well, I'm going to give you an opportunity for you to raise your hand and to make a stand for him. Well, Pedro, why should I raise my hand? What do you, what, why should I do that? Well, by raising your hand, what you're doing is you're receiving him to yourself. You are 
acknowledging him. The Bible says to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called his children. To those who receive him and to those who believe on his name. And that's what you're doing by raising your hand. You're acknowledging your need for a savior. You're coming to God saying, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And people, all of us are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And that's why we need a savior. And yet there's some that are closer to God in the sense of, you know, um, as it relates to, you know, thinking about God and stuff like that. And there's people that are not thinking about God, but you are both equally far if it's not for the solution that God gave by way of the cross, where he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world, for your sins, for my sins. He did nothing less to save me than he does for a serial killer. It's all grace. And that's what I'm asking you to embrace right here is the gift of God. You can't earn it. You can't behave your way for it. You know, you can't be good enough for it. All you can do is take it, receive it, enjoy it, embrace it, and watch it change your life. And maybe there's some of you here today that today is your day. And you're saying, man, I need to get right with God. Let me tell you, he brought you here. It's no accident that you're here. I believe that today is your day. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, you want to have brand new start you want Jesus to come into your life do you want to know that if you die today you're gonna to go to heaven do you want to start living for the reality of who you are and start embracing your spiritual identity well that's you then respond to this invitation I'm about to give with their heads bowed and their eyes closed how many of you would say Pedro pray for me I want a relationship with God I want to settle the issue with him today I want to fully embrace his will his purpose his plan I want his peace I want to start living with Him and for Him. I want a relationship with Him. If that's you, right where you're sitting, I want you to raise your hand right now because I want to pray for you. God bless you, and God bless you, and God bless you, and God bless you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Anybody else? God bless you, man. I see you. And you. Father, I just thank you so much for these hands, Lord. And God, as I give them an opportunity, God, to make a stand for you, Lord. God, I pray that, God, you would cause them, Lord, to rise up and stand in, in boldness and, and make their way here to the front as we uh, sing um, to you the cornerstone, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. For those of you that raised your hand, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. This is a bold move, you know, but remember I said I'm going to give you an opportunity for you to raise your hand and then to make a stand for him. But well, what are you asking us to do, Pedro? Well, the band's going to come back in and we're going to sing this song. And right where you're at, I want you to get up out of your seat, make your way here to the front, facing me, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Don't worry, I'm not going to hand the mic to you. I'm not going to hand the mic to you in the sense of uh, I'm going to ask you, hey, so tell me what your story is. I'm just going to just lead you in a prayer. It's a repeat after me prayer. There'll be several people up here in the front with you. And now you're saying, well, Pedro, why are you asking us to do this? Well, because I believe when Jesus died for our sins, he did so publicly. And I think it's only appropriate now that we die to the old life and come alive to the new one and that we would do so publicly. Now, what's everybody in the room going to think, Pedro? That's embarrassing. i tell you what they're going to think. They're going to think there goes a person that has just made the greatest decision of their entire life. So maybe you don't want to come by yourself. Maybe ask a person that came with you, hey, would you come with me? They'll come with you. You know, some of you are in parts where I saw hands go up where you got people this way, people that way, and you're like, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, man. You know, I just stay right here and then figure it out later. No, no, listen, step on their toes in Jesus' name. If they knew that that's what was keeping you, they would throw you to the front right now. They'll crowd surf you. Why? Well, because they remember the day that they made that decision. I remember the day that I made that decision. I went to a church, invited by a stranger, heard a gospel, went forward, and my life has never been the same. And today is that day for you. So wherever you're at, right now, you don't wait for somebody else to come. If you are God's dealing with you right now, you come, you make your way, and stand right here in Jesus' name.
more time. Thank you, God. So good. Wow, that heart. I love it. I love it. You have no idea how wild that heart God wants you to be, man. And uh, you have no idea. You know, many times people think, oh, we become a Christian. They're going to kind of give us this haircut, put a pocket protector in us, and now we're going to hang out. Oh, oh. You know, listen, God right now is going to take your life and all the passion that you've got, and he's just going to redirect it in a, the way that we should be going. That's the God that we serve. He's not stripping us of anything. He is now going to set you free to be all that God has created you to be. Amen. Man, today is your day, man. Wow. So here's what's going to happen. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then after the prayer, you're going to see uh, 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 Orlando. Man, it has been here for 100 years. But uh, Orlando and Tanya, um, they've been doing this for a while. And, uh, and, and then you're just going to spend a few moments with them. And they're going to give you a Bible. And just spend a few moments with them. But what this day is for you right now is the start of a journey. And what I encourage you to do is that next week, you get back here. Make a decision. You're going to come back to church. You know, and then the week after that, come back to church. And the week after that, come back to church. And then just to make sure that I, you understand what I'm saying, what are you going to do the week after that? Come back to church. And then you throw in a Wednesday. And then all your friends are going to think you're fanatical. And uh, that's a good thing, man. There's nothing greater that we could be a fanatic of than the one who spoke the universe into being. The one who made us. So this is just a walk with him. I remember the day that I did this same thing you're doing. I remember it like it was yesterday, though it keeps getting further and further away. Some guy invited me to a church, a stranger at a party. I went and I did the same exact thing that you did right now. And you know what? When I was going up there, I had no idea what I was doing. But I knew that God was calling me to do it for sure. And there, what started was a daily walk with him where he is changing me transforming me I'm not where I should be or will or where I will once be but praise God I'm not where I used to be but I am on a journey where he is changing me transforming me every day and in every way and that's what's just begun here for you Today is your day. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and then we're going to send you off this way just so you can get this Bible, and just it's going to be just a few moments, but repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I open my heart, I invite you inside to be my friend, to be my Savior, and to be my God. Forgive me of my sin, wash me clean, from this day forward. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I believe in you and I put my trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen and amen. So good. You can just make your way over here and just. Let's just declare in this place one more time, Christ alone, He is our cornerstone. Without Jesus, we've got nothing. He is the one who shows us grace to save us. It is the grace that keeps us. It is the grace that sustains us. And it is found in Him. He is the hope.